Well, good morning, church. <laughs> Man, that was worth waking up for right there. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, open them back again to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, we're, as you can see maybe on the screen, uh, we have one focal verse this morning. Um, to be honest with you, I shared with Rena, I fully intended to go from 25 to 36. And even because of y'all don't have all day. I only got to 25, which means if you're looking at the text, I didn't even finish a sentence. So, forgive me. But I want us to begin reading from verse 17. And we'll read all the way through the end of the chapter. Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 17. But as some of the branches were broken off, and you, Gentiles, he's speaking of here, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them, the Jews, and became a partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast against them, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell, fell severity, but to you God's kindness. If you continue in His kindness, other, kindness, otherwise you will also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want you, brothers, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so, also, so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are, are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How searchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became His counselor or who has first given to Him that it might be repaid to Him? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. As we have studied throughout uh, these 11 chapters of the book of Romans so far, we have seen repeatedly taught and exemplified by Paul throughout this letter <clears throat> over and over and over again what Paul stated as the thesis for this letter that he puts, gives us in chapter 1, verse 16. And that is that salvation is provided by God through the conduit of faith, whether Jew or Gentile. 
Jew or Greek, he says there. Let's read that. I'm going to put this up here for you. Um, hmm, did I skip that? I did skip that. No, I didn't skip it. Here it is. He says, therefore, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Right there in the beginning of this letter, he is stating very clearly that salvation comes solely by the power of God and only to those who are believing. It is not the power of God combined with those who are believing, the power of those who are believing, the intellect of those who are believing, the moral, the moral consciousness of those who are believing, the, those who have a predisposition just somewhere inherent in them to gravitate toward God more so than others. It's not any of that, but it is by the power of God alone. And in case anyone is still tempted to ascribe credit to the ones believing as having more goodness and wisdom somehow inherently within them than other people, which enables those people to believe, the, the, the ones believing, this thought is completely put to rest in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. <clears throat> Let's see if I can find it here. There it is, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that most all of you are familiar with. If you've been around church for any length of time, you've been exposed to the gospel any length of time, you've heard this, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. Now, grammatically speaking, I've pointed this out before. We've talked about it on, in our men's Bible study, I know, a couple of times on, on Tuesday morning. The construction of this verse, namely verse 8 here, puts a lasso around both the terms grace and faith. Grammatically speaking, making them one unit. And so what Paul is saying here is that both the grace and the faith are the gift of God. It's not just the grace and then you conjure up the faith. The faith you're acting on to participate in the grace, the gift, is given to you as well. You've got nothing to boast. I have nothing to boast about. We don't have anything to boast about before God. And nor do we have anything to boast about before anyone else. A key element in our thinking as Christians is and always must be not only a right thinking about God. That's foundational. This is called a proper theology, right? Theology is, is just a big word meaning how we think about God. Now, again, you can have good theology or you can have bad theology, but everyone has a theology. <clears throat> That's foundational. When we have that right, and we're truly thinking through that rightly, we also have what is called a proper anthropology, meaning a right thinking about man. More specifically, a right thinking about our own selves. And Jesus was making this point to a bunch of religious people in his own time. In Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5 there, he says, now at that time, that same time, there were some present who were reporting to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, do you think that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered these things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you think that those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse offenders than all the men who live in Jerusalem. I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Job's friends had the same thinking, if you recall. They came to him looking at all that happened to Job, and what was their argument? Job, you've done something wrong, dude. You're worse off than we are because you're worse than we are, obviously. You have offended God. You are in sin or else this stuff wouldn't happen to you. Jesus is saying, that is not so. Do not look that way. Again, we, we have no business looking at the circumstances of others and thinking ourselves to be better than those people. In all of what we have looked at, as Paul has unfolded, the doctrine 
of the sovereignty of God over salvation for all who will be saved, the point of it all is exactly what Paul gets to in verse 36 of this chapter, which is the title of today's message, as you saw a few moments ago, To God Be the Glory, part one. But to God be the glory. That's the point. <clears throat> Once again, to point out why Paul has brought this whole discussion of the, of the Jewish nation of Israel to bear in chapters 9, 10, and 11. We need to take note again of something we observed in, in chapter 8, verses 28, 9, and 30. <clears throat> and this is what Paul writes there. This is what launches into what we've been looking at in verse chapters 9 through 11. Verse 29 of chapter 8, Paul says there again, because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. Now, that verse 29 is out of the LSB. Verse 30, as you see, I noted, notated there for you, is a direct translation from the Greek. And I've emphasized in capital letters there those words to bring, the, bring your attention to them. Verse 30, direct translation from the Greek. And whom he predestined? These also he called, and whom he called, these also he justified, and whom he justified, these also he glorified. Now, again, the certainty of it all, he foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified. It is written in a way that the, the succeeding verbs are not a possibility of being left unfulfilled. It is written so that it is to be understood that whom he foreknew in eternity past, whom he, whom he predestined in eternity past, will be, it is a done deal, every single one of them in the aorist tense, it is a done deal that they are also to be called, justified, and glorified. It's done. It's done. It's all lassoed together here as well. The observation, though, that I really want to bring to our attention, once again, is that nowhere in this, what is called the golden chain of redemption, is any active verb applied to those being foreknown, predestined, called, justified, or glorified. They're all in the passive voice. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. It is all the work of God, independent and completely dependent upon Him. Wholly dependent upon Him. Not at all dependent upon mankind in any way, shape, or form. And if you recall... Immediately following this clear, emphatic declaration here in these verses, Paul concludes that chapter, chapter 8, with the most amazingly encouraging extolment of the absolute certainty that I'm trying to drive in here that absolutely nothing can ever separate the believer. Who's the believer? The one who has been foreknown predestined, called, justified, and glorified. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of Christ. Let's recall those. Let's look at that again. Verses 31 to 39. It might be easier for you to just turn your pages back a couple in your Bible. Verse 31, he says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who indeed did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who, was, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Man. Man. Verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will affliction or turmoil or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are, 
were counted as sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is from this platform, verses 29 through 39 of chapter 8, that Paul launches into the quintessential historical and biblical testimony of and the evidence of the immutable choice of God to do what He has said He is going to do for whose glory? For Israel's glory? For the Gentiles' glory? No, for His own glory in saving a particular people. And that is His sovereign election. The example He's giving is that sovereign election of national Israel in serving a specific purpose in redemptive history in its entirety. I was, I was asked just last week after the service by one of my dear brothers if I was holding to what is called a replacement theology. In which theology, the belief is that the church has somehow replaced Israel. That Israel has been essentially done away with, kind of almost kicked to the curb with, you know, in the ongoing plan of God because they have served their purpose in bringing us the Messiah, but they rejected him, and so he's done with them. The claim is that these promises that were given originally, articulated to Abraham and his seed by God, are now transferred from Israel to the church. The church being separate from national Israel completely, and that they're to be fulfilled spiritually and not literally. And I don't know if he was baiting me for fun, because he might be inclined to do that. Or if, if I had been that bad at explaining what the scriptures actually emphatically state here in these passages, particularly in this very, pa this very chapter. But the answer is absolutely no. I, I, I do not hold to replacement theology because the scriptures are so emphatically clear here. And no matter what interpretation someone comes up with of some other, what you could say are arguably more obscure passages, I cannot get past the exercise of a straightforward exegesis of this whole section of Scripture, and emphatically so in this very, very chapter. And always when I get, and I get them, when I get people challenge me on this, I just, all I want to do is look. Just do this for me. Exegete this passage. I want to see your exegesis. And other passages. Looking back again for our reminder. Look up in chapter 11 to verses 1 through 5. Paul says there, and he asks the question, I say then, has God rejected his people? May it never be. May genoita. May genoita. Strongest most emphatic negation available in the great Greek language. And he goes on to explain, For I too am an Israelite, a seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. And then he restates the question in sentence form, which is again making this a somber and clear declaration, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Now that word foreknew is the same exact word and used in the same exact way as verse 29 of chapter 8. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars. And I alone am left. And they're seeking my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have left for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In this way then, at the present time, a remnant, according to God's gracious choice, has also come to be. Verse 11 of this chapter. I say then, did they stumble so as to fall? That fall, in this context, means to utter destruction, to their end. Again, he answers, may it never be, again, meganoita. 
But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Why? To make them jealous. Verse 15, for if their rejection, and we noted last week that this rejection, this word, is a different word from verse 1. Verse 1 means utter rejection, utter turning away. This one means more of a setting aside, a temporary setting aside. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Again, he can't get a greater contrast to explain and express the blessing, the wonder of it all from between life, li life and death. Up, down, yes. Verse 24, for if you were cut off from what you being the Gentiles, were cut off what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into what? Their own tree. Again, the phrase their own olive tree indicates a prepossession afforded by divine right for ethnic Jews in contrast to anything prepossessed by Gentiles afforded by divine right. There is a reason why he put that in there. It is to bring out the contrast between the two. To undo any undue confusion. It is plain to see from the text that the circumstances being of, of, of being grafted in, in which a branch can be broken off, is not speaking of people, and more specifically in this case, the Gentiles, once being saved, it doesn't mean that they're grafted in in salvation, then possibly losing their salvation, where he warns, you will be broken off too. The fact that the natural born Jews are said to have been broken off because of their unbelief means that the promises to the nation of Israel had been generally extended to all of Israel, but only ultimately effectuated according to the sovereign election of God on particular Jews, creating, as we have pointed out multiple times now, a subset of the whole set of ethnic Jews. The unbelieving Jews were then broken off, having forfeited the experience of the totality of the promises made to Abraham and to his descendants. And I say totality because the promises were experienced to some degree even of the non-elect descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There were certain benefits that they enjoyed simply because they were of that lineage. And I think it still holds true today to a great degree. But as you recall, in Genesis chapter 21, verse 13, God told Abraham when Ishmael and Hagar were being sent away, he said to him, I will make a nation of him. And he gives the prepositional phrase explaining a causal preposition because he is your seed. He didn't just say he is your son, but he is your seed. When he speaks here in this passage of the Gentiles being grafted in, he is speaking of all Gentiles being grafted in at the inauguration of the new covenant in Jesus Christ and the doing away with the old covenant of the Mosaic law. And it is because in the same, it's in the same exact context in that he is speaking to the Jews or speaking of the Jews he is obviously speaking in the same terms of the open door of salvation extending beyond the Mosaic Covenant and the sacrificial laws applying to national Israel and going out from there in, in reference to salvation to the entire Gentile world. He is obviously not exclusively speaking at this stage of the picture. When you're reading this, understand what Paul is giving. When he's, when he's giving you a tree... Branches that are natural to it, those natural branches being broken off. Branches that are not natural to it being grafted in. And even some of those in danger of being broken off. And then some of the others 
who were broken off of the Jews, being grafted back in. We're not talking about a still picture. We're talking about a moving picture, a changing picture, if you will. So he, he's not talking in being grafting it, grafted in to begin with of the Gentiles of only exclusively believing Gentiles. He's talking there about the door was open. The wall of partition between the Gentiles and the Jews was broken down. So the general call extended then to all the world. The effectual call does not. Just as all the descendants of Abraham had been generally included in the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and yet only a remnant of them would be saved, whom God sovereignly again foreknew, predestined, effectually called, justified, and glorified, so too have all the Gentiles been grafted into that tree, receiving the general call to repentance, as we saw last week in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, and yet all the unbelieving Gentiles will be broken off, just like the unbelieving Jews. All those Jews who have been broken off and remain in their unbelief will be eternally lost. They do not gain salvation just because they're Jews. All are saved by grace through faith. And no other way. And all those Gentiles who are broken off because of their unbelief will be eternally lost, of course, except for those Gentiles whom He has foreknown, predestined, effectually called, justified, and glorified. So you have here again a, a picture of a tree that has good branches. And it has bad branches. But again, it's not a still picture. It's a moving picture in which the, the, the picture changes throughout redemptive history from beginning to end. And it, beginning with a mixture of good and bad branches, to its culmination is going to be a tree that is gloriously beautiful, that God Himself has made and created. It is going to have, a, it is going to have both Jew and Gentile on this tree. But every single branch there will be a good branch, made good by God Himself. The power of God unto salvation is what He says in chapter 1, verse 16. And the end of it all, again, is going to be a beautiful, beautiful picture. Verse 25 of our text. He says, For I do not want you, brothers, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. What mystery? Well, John D. Harvey points out that Paul uses the term mystery, and a lot of people just jump on it and they just start running with that. But he, has, he uses the term mystery in his letters in several different contexts. Uh, let's see here. Somehow, there it is. One is the bodily change at the resurrection. This is a mystery, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. The principle of lawlessness embodied in the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. That's a mystery. The basic tenets of the Christian faith are even, by, according to Paul, a mystery in 1 Timothy 3, verses 9 and 16. Unspecified divine secrets obviously are a mystery. 1 Corinthians 4, 1, chapter 13, verse 2, chapter 14, verse 2. The eternal counsel of God eschatologically fulfilled in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, and verse 9. Chapter 6, verse 19. Colossians chapter 1, 26 and 27. Chapter 2, verse 2, chapter 4, verse 3. And in here, in this context he is describing God's three-step plan for the restoration of Israel Israel first is partially hardened the full number of Gentiles are brought in and step three is all Israel is saved that the nation of Israel chosen by God to be his 
particular and peculiar people would be partially hardened until, and as, as he has already stated, so that the fullness or full number, which is what that word really means, of the Gentile elect are brought in. Now, we can't let get past us all the implications of that little statement there. Even, even that very phrase where he says, until which the full number of the Gentiles has come in. I, I just gave you, when I said that in that phrase, some of you guys are looking at your Bibles and going, I, that's not exactly what it says here. But that is a direct translation, again, from the Greek text. Until which the full number of the Gentiles has come in. The word until in that, in that text there is, is from the word akri, which is an adverb of time. And the relative pronoun who, which, which, in which, with which it is connected, gives specificity and definiteness, indicating a predetermined point in time when both the time in history and the number of the Gentile elect coincide according to the predetermined plan of God. That's what predestination means, a predetermined plan. Once again, a proper understanding of our own selves is very much what Paul wants his readers, particularly his Gentile readers at this point, to get driven deeply into their hearts and minds. And the the one way that that's going to happen for any of us is by gaining a right understanding of the God we worship. Not that we are able to comprehend Him, but that we are able to comprehend Him that he is and that he is incomprehensible by us and that he is incomprehensibly sovereignly in control don't miss that that he is incomprehensibly sovereignly in control so many people get all twisted up i just can't understand this How that our wills are in effect, but yet it's only by His will that our wills are in effect. He is absolutely and completely, totally sovereign, and yet we're we're held responsible for the choices we make. We're held responsible for even acting on faith to believe. We're held responsible for that. I don't know. I don't understand. Understand this. It means that you have and you worship an infinite God. One you can't wrap your mind around and pull in and contain within your little brain. He says here that the reason that he is informing his audience of this mystery is what? So that they will not be wise to their own selves. In other words, don't be conceited. we are saved, all of us, Jew and Gentile, only by the grace and mercy of God, and there is nothing in us that warrants condescension toward anyone else at all, at all. Note also that this hardening that he speaks of here, it's only a partial hardening concerning Israel. And he's reflecting back again to the biblical truth he was pointed to in the beginning of this chapter. Remember in verse verse 2, he says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And then in verse 5, he says, in this way then, at the present time, a remnant according to God's gracious choice has also come to be. God has always and will always divinely keep for himself a remnant of believing Jews until the aforementioned specified time in which the full number of the Gentiles has come in. It is significant in grasping the eternally decreed plan of God to make note of the fact that the concept and the principle of the remnant, don't miss this, though it is put forward multiple times throughout the Old Testament, the principle and concept of remnant <clears throat> and now here, even in the New Testament, is never applied to Gentiles. Remnant is only and always applied to ethnic Jews. Don't forget that. 
There's a reason. And that reason at, is that God is going to do what he said he was going to do. And he's going to do it for his own glory. The more undeserving they are, the more glorious it is for him. And trust me, they have proven themselves as a whole to be supremely unworthy in how they behave toward the Messiah. In light of the, in light of the word that they have been given, all the prophets, everything, the promises that they have been given, the signs that they have been given. So though the hardening may be seen even in the overwhelming majority of Israel still to this day, it is not the whole and therefore still is only a partial hardening. This, this inordinate ratio of unbelieving Jews to believing Jews that we see today was most definitely true even of Paul's day. And he, by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, he knew what time it was, so to speak. He knew what was going on. At the end of the book of Acts, if you recall, Paul is a prisoner having been taken to Rome. And, and once there, he has, he's, he's called the Jewish leadership together. He wants to address them. You remember, he's there because of the Jews in Jerusalem. Got arrested, falsely accused, all of that. And he's now made the, 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 the long and treacherous journey as a prisoner in Rome. And he's called them together. In Acts chapter 28, verse 17, it says, And it happened, Luke's recording this, And it happened that after three days, Paul's gotten to Rome finally, it's three days later, Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews. And when they came together, he began saying to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Now, what happened is, is they agreed to hear more from him about this Jesus. They had heard about Christianity, heard that it was bad, and, and so they agreed to hear more. And in, and in verses 23 to 31, Luke records, And when they had set a day for Paul, they came to him, excuse me, at his lodging in large numbers, and he was explaining to them by solemnly bearing witness about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. And some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others were not believing. And when they disagreed with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes, lest they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God was sent to the Gentiles. They will also hear. When he had spoken these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence unhindered. So we see at the end of the book of Acts that there were some Jews who were believing and some Jews who were not. The result being two things. One is that Paul turned to the Gentiles as his primary audience. Secondly, he intentionally told those Jews that he was doing so. Now, Luke doesn't tell us in that, in that passage there why Paul said what he said to them in Acts chapter 28, but Paul tells us in verses 13 and 14 of our, of our chapter 11 here in Romans. He says there, but I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. What verse 14 say? If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. So it is a partial, partial hardening in number, but not an entire hardening in number. He didn't harden the whole of Israel, only a part of them. But neither is this partial hardening in the ones who are hardened. 
In other words, it's a complete and total hardening in those who are hardened. Porosis is the Greek word that is translated here for hardening. And it signifies a state or condition of complete lack of understanding, dullness, insensibility, obstinacy. Though they're hearing, they ain't hearing. And they have no desire to do so. This kind of hardening does not occur only among Jews. It happens among the Gentiles as well. As most all of you who have shared the gospel to any number of people, you've, you've seen this and you've learned this, hopefully. Do not be discouraged. This goes all the way back. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 19, Paul says there, Therefore I, this I say and testify in the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their mind, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. That's that word, potosis. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. And Paul, take, think about this. Paul is writing to Gentiles in Ephesus. And yet he tells his readers not to walk or live or behave like Gentiles do. Do we not see here in his dealings with Gentiles a line of delineation between believing and unbelieving Gentiles just as he has given of the whole of the Jews as well? A line of delineation between those who are believing and those who are not. Now, again, elsewhere we see there is... There is Israel, and then there is true Israel. True Israel are those who are elect, those who are believing, those who are of descendants of Abraham, and Jesus dealt with this himself. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you're not his children. Anyway, I want to go back to the directly translated phrase from the end of verse 25 there, where we had until which the full number of the Gentiles has come in. I want us to see further the specificity that is being communicated here by Paul, not only in the grammar of the until which that we've already dealt with, but also in the grammar of the full number of the Gentiles. The phrase of the Gentiles is what is called a partive, partitive genitive phrase, which means that here again, the full number or the fullness of the Gentiles who will be saved is actually only part of the Gentiles, not all. This is a part of the genitive. In other words, out from, out from the Gentiles. There's the whole class of Gentiles. But the full number that are going to come in is not that whole class. It's the full number that God has foreknown, predestined, called. He's calling, or He will call, will justify and glorify. It's that group. That's who He's talking about here. We need to get that. Again, this will become important in interpreting uh, verse 32 when we get to that. But again, it is a specified number out of the whole class of Gentiles. While here Paul is indicating a known number, it is not to be seen as a quota type of a number. Uh, it, in other words, God knows exactly who that number is. He's not, he's not sitting up in heaven telling his angels, look, when we reach this, this many, you let me know and I'll shut her down. I, I got to have this many. Then we're good. That's not what God is doing. We who will be among that number are already eternally, personally known to Him. In John chapter 10, this is huge in explaining this. John chapter 10, verses 11, 14 to 16, 27, 28. It's what I pulled out here and put together. In verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I want you to note that. The sheep. The definite article is there. The sheep. Verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. 
Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I laid down, and I laid down my life for the sheep. I put there in the parentheses there, did I leave it in? I guess I didn't, I'm sorry. This is not for all sheep, but for the sheep that he is referring to. For those who believe in universal atonement, this, this absolutely is a nuclear bomb right at the foundation of that thought. It is particular atonement. Now, this may be, whew, I don't, you may be sitting there going, I have no idea what he's talking about. You can ask one of us later what we're talking about here. Verse 16, and I have other sheep. I own, I have, I possess. Right now, it's already predetermined. I have other sheep which are not from this fold. I must bring them also. Now, what is he saying there? I'm not, I'm not taking I, there's, no, there's a fold established. I'm bringing those that are not of this fold into this one. And they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish ever. I love what the LSB does there. Because it's bringing out the emphasis in the Greek. It, it, no, not at all. It is not possible. Inconceivable. They won't ever perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. We who are of that number and all who will be in the future, in time and space, of that specified number are already known and have eternally been known by him. Again, there's a definite plan that we are all a part of, and it is to the glory of God that he has revealed this mystery, this much of the mystery to us. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, he writes there, Paul says, just as he chose us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love by predestining us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He graciously bestowed on us in the Beloved, Jesus Christ. In closing for this week, my prayer is that we are compelled within our hearts, even in the midst of all this stuff about Jews and Gentiles, to do what Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is actually driving us to do. And that is not to get caught up looking across at other human beings, other groups of human beings, and then thinking too highly of ourselves or too lowly of others but to look to God and God alone and give Him praise for the wonderful, gracious, merciful work He has done in drawing us to Him to, to extend His mercy and grace to us in salvation and then to be amazed at how He's done this and how He is demonstrating his sovereignty through all of what we can't, we can't explain. We never would have imagined how it came about. We can't imagine even how what we know prophetically could come about is going to actually specifically come about. But what we can know is that what he said he's going to do, he's actually going to do. Now, Paul is immensely concerned that his audience embrace this understanding that we are, we are to look to him for glory and to look at each other. I don't care what color. I don't care how many, how, what hair, I don't, I, tattoos, no tattoos, piercings, no piercings. I don't care. Nice clothes, not nice clothes. Slept under a bridge, slept in a mansion. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. When God brings one to salvation, it's a time of rejoicing and embracing and glorifying God for what He alone has done. 
Paul is so concerned with this. People get, they miss it. They start wrestling over Jew, Gentile, the church, all this kind. This, this is what he's driving at underneath here. And as we look farther into the scriptural history behind all of what Paul is saying next week regarding the Jews and the Gentiles and what have you, Again, I pray that we are hit with wave after wave of even emotions. Emotions in praising, worshiping, and glorifying Him for what He has done, for what He is doing, for what He will do. Now here, that's, that's for us believers. That's, that's for us for who have come to faith in Christ. But for those that might be in our midst today, listen, you may have never truly come to faith in Christ before. And you're hearing all this emphasis on the sovereignty of God and His work in saving a particular people to Himself. And you're, Here's the question for you. Are you sensing today, this very moment, a realization that you need a Savior? Are you sensing today that you're being drawn by some, something, someone outside of you to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, this Savior, to be able to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you have an eternal destiny with Him? In his presence, that could never, ever, ever be taken away. No matter what happens in this world, are you feeling, sensing, a drawing to that? If you are, then I'm begging you, I am begging you to do as I did one night in 1981. When I came to that point, I I didn't know a whole lot of these theological categories and things that I've even mentioned that I had no clue about them. What I knew was that before God, I was guilty. I had tried for nearly a year to straighten my own self up. I knew my own weakness. I had counted the cost for two and a half months attending that church, listening to the messages, having determined in my own mind before That if I were going to get to the point where I called myself a Christian, I was going to be a Christian, not a hypocrite. Not one who claimed the name when it was convenient and hid the name when it wasn't. And God brought me to that point that night where I was irresistibly drawn and I, I, it's like, it's like, in my heart, in my mind, everything. It was like being at the edge of the Grand Canyon and not actually being able to see right over, but taking a step off in total faith and trust, just saying, God, there's nothing I'm holding on to that is worth an eternity in hell. And I'm just going to step. I don't, I'm not trying to fabricate a bungee cord, a parachute, a safety net, or anything. I'm not holding on to anything. I'm just going to trust that you're going to make me what you what you have called us to be. I can't do this. And I did. And I've never gotten over it. And I'm begging you. If that's you today, I'm I'm pleading with you. Don't hold on to what you've been holding on to. Trust in Him today. Repent. Turn from your sins. Put your trust in the Jesus Christ who was eternally God, took on flesh, came down in the form of that baby, lived a perfect life that you and I cannot live. And He went to that cross on your behalf, on our behalf, on my behalf, to pay the due penalty of us. And not only doing that, 
He satisfied the wrath of the Father so that if we put our trust in Him, we are no longer seen by Him as an enemy. He sees us as His own son or daughter to have bold access to His throne all the time without hindrance. No one can step between us. Don't leave today without grabbing one of us and saying, I, I have done that, or I want to. And then as you'll see in a few moments, follow in believer's baptism, making that declaration, as the scriptures tell us, it is a picture of our death, burial, and resurrection to new life in Christ. We are identifying then with Him, expressing our faith. We are identifying with Him in His death, burial, and resurrection, telling others we have died to our old self, been buried and raised again in Him. That's what we're fixing to observe. And that's what we're called to. Let's pray. God, our Father, I know I've said a lot of words this morning. I am praying that your Holy Spirit work beyond just the sound waves coming out of my voice. God, that you are, particularly for your church, you move us, Lord, to be amazed, wonderfully amazed. Move us, O oh God, that we cannot do anything else but give you praise and honor and glory by the exhibition of your power of what you have done throughout history, what you are doing now, what you've done in our own lives. God, again, for those here that before now, before now, they, are, they have not been identified as part of that full number of Gentiles or Jews to be brought in. Oh, God, that today would be the day. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor TJ, if you would, brother, come and lead us.